one of the parts of the DNA of Dallas Theological Seminary is an attention to the spiritual life. Uh, there is godliness, and especially our worship of and imitation of our Heavenly Father. Uh, there is the Christian life that is related especially to the second person, Jesus Christ. But there's life in the Spirit, and walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. There's a whole element of dimension of our Christian life that is related to the third member of the Trinity, and that's the Spirit. And so uh, we give this week as attention to uh, uh, allowing the Holy Spirit of God to address our lives at the core level of our lives, where uh, the thoughts and the intents of the heart can be discerned, exposing ourselves to the Word of God uh, in honor of the Father, because of Jesus Christ, but through the power and the convicting work and the changing work of the Spirit. We all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into that glory, that same glory, from glory to glory, into that same image, from glory to glory, whereas by the Lord and especially the Spirit, the second person of the Trinity. And so that's what this week is about, and we're delighted to welcome Dr. Vodi Bakum. If you were not here yesterday, let me introduce him. I uh, was away yesterday for a seminary function at the Weston Hotel where we were asking many folks to uh, uh, give so that you wouldn't have to pay as high tuition. And so it was a great day. Uh, Joel Rosenberg was our guest speaker and it was a wonderful day. And, uh, but I bring you greetings and it's great to be back with you. Dr. Vodi Bakum has uh, many hats that he wears, husband, father, pastor, author, professor, conference speaker, and church planter. You've heard about the degrees uh, that he has earned. He's currently serving as the Dean of the Seminary at the African Christian University, ACU, in Lusaka, Zambia. Zambia, excuse me. In August 2015, Vodi and his uh, faithful wife, Bridget, and seven uh, of their youngest children of nine made a bold move from the heart of Texas to the heart of Africa. Uh, he is an accomplished martial artist, so you will like his week of meetings, won't you? <laughs> He's won numerous uh, tournaments and titles, including winning the 2014 Pan American Championship in his division. So uh, don't cross him in the hallway, just uh, salute him and smile, and uh, it's terrific. Vodi is uh, very much in demand, and uh, we're so privileged that he has uh, given us this week of his life to uh, build into our lives. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Vodi Bakum to DTS? All right. We're looking at uh, apologetics. And when I talked about it yesterday, it's a lot of like, okay, our spiritual life and apologetics. And I hope yesterday you saw how we make that connection. Today, I want to make that connection um, even clearer. And I want to look at apologetics as an expression of our personal holiness. Apologetics as an expression of our personal holiness. If you go with me to the book of First Peter, and again, First Peter three is where we even get the the word right. And the uh, word apologetics is is one of those words that we don't didn't translate. We sort of transliterated, kind of like you know deacon, right? We didn't really translate deacon, we just transliterated, and it became diakonos. Um, doesn't tell us a whole lot about what it means. Uh, apologetics, the same way. Uh, apologia, we just sort of transliterated, and we get from that apologetics, or an apology, to make an apology, um, or a reasoned response, a reasoned defense. We get that from 1 Peter 3.15. And as we talked about on yesterday, um, we, what's our, what's our drop-dead time? What's our? 11.25. 11.25. Okay. I had more time yesterday. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so as, we, as, we look at this, uh, as we look at this text today, one of the things we talked about on yesterday was I argue that we think wrongly about apologetics because we've, we've defined it wrongly. We look at apologetics as this kind of, you know, you know, Navy SEAL, Green Beret, Delta Force kind of branch of Christianity. It's only for people who are the elite of the elite. 
And I hope on yesterday you saw uh, that that's not the case, that apologetics is for every believer. We saw that in Jude, and I alluded to this text in 1 Peter as well, um, in showing that apologetics is for every believer. Um, and when we look at the definition, um, again, the definition based on what we find here in this text, knowing what you believe, knowing why you believe it, and being able to communicate that in a winsome and effective way, um, again, that, that takes apologetics out of that realm of the elite only. But for me, when I look at this very verse that gave us the term, and put it in the context of the letter wherein we find this verse, that's where I come up with the idea that this is really part of an expression of our personal holiness. Now, in order for us to do this, we can't start there at verse 15. Back up with me, if you will, and let's sort of put this section in context. Uh, back up with me and look at chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And again, this is, you know, we look at this first part of Peter, like a lot of the epistles, we, we get the indicatives and then the imperatives. We, we get the indicatives that tell us who we are. Are, right? And because of what Christ has done. And then we get the imperatives. And the imperatives are the things that we're told to do, but they're related to those indicatives. When we look at the indicatives, we, we see what Christ has accomplished on our behalf to the Father's glory through the cross. That's what we see in the indicatives. What Christ has accomplished on our behalf to the Father's glory through the cross. That's how and why we are who and what we are. Because of what Christ has accomplished to the Father's glory on our behalf through the cross. Amen? And this is what we see here in chapter 2. That, that we are, he doesn't say you need to be a royal priesthood. This is not an imperative. This isn't the indicative. You, you are. That's who you are. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's who we are. Right? So, get that. And right after that, he starts a discussion about suffering. This idea that we are chosen, that we're set apart, that this is the idea of, of us being, of being holy. And then he starts a discussion about suffering. Verse 13, we're to be subject to every institution. And so he talks about the government. Verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. And then he talks about not just the good and gentle, but the unjust. So here's the suffering of being under an unjust master. There's the suffering of being un under an unjust government. Now there's the suffering of being under an unjust master. Then he comes down in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word. So now there's the suffering of being submitted to an unjust or unrighteous husband, right? Then after this sort of general statement about all of us and our submission in suffering, so on and so forth, he gets these specific statements and then he comes back to the general again. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Finally, all of you, or as we said yesterday, the proper grammatical rendering of that is, finally, all y'all, okay, <laughs> have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for th to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. So this is about how we suffer about how we endure. So again, this whole segment, before we can look at 315 here, this, this whole segment comes after this statement of us being set apart as a royal priesthood. This whole statement comes after us looking at what it's like for us as a people who've been set apart within this world as this royal priesthood and the sufferings that we have to endure in general ways and in particular ways, depending on our circumstances. 
And it is in this context that we have this statement about apologetics, starting at verse 15. Now, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Even if you suffer for righteousness sake. So our personal holiness, again, I would argue, first of all, sets us apart as this royal priesthood. Our, our, our personal holiness, our holiness as individuals and our holiness as a people. The fact that we're marked by this holiness as a people of God sets us apart. But in setting us apart, there's another thing that happens. It brings suffering. Our personal holiness often results in suffering. Now, this is something that we often don't think about or understand in the context of our culture. We're starting to think about it more. Amen? You're having all these talks about religious liberty. We're losing religious liberties, and if we lose religious liberties, and da 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 this, and the other. But, but know this. As Americans, we're, we're freaks of nature. We cannot comprehend Christian history because our experience as Americans is unlike the overwhelming majority of Christian history. For the overwhelming majority of Christian history and for the overwhelming majority of Christians today, they don't sit around and contemplate what it would be like theoretically if they lost religious liberty. It is and always has been the reality that this personal holiness, this being separate, this being a called out people within the context and confines of a culture of opposition usually leads to suffering. Now, before we move on, we, we've already done a great deal. Because again, for most of us, you say the word apologetics, and we think, you know, the skilled debater and philosopher, we think about, you know, an, an offensive tool out there making arguments to win people over to our side. This is the way we think. But the context right here for the very verse that gives us the very word is suffering. Apologetics is not about being cool. Apologetics is really not even about us gaining cultural capital. Apologetics is not about swaying the populace in our direction. Apologetics is about how we suffer as a direct result of our personal holiness. It's ultimately about how we suffer. Secondly, this holiness is born of our devotion to Christ. Verse 15, the first part, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Interestingly enough, there is a reference here to Isaiah 8.13. When you look at Isaiah 8.13 and understand the context of Isaiah's statement, it speaks to Peter's statement. Isaiah 8.13, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. What's the context there? The Assyrians are coming. Do not look to the Assyrians and let the Assyrians be your fear and your dread. Don't fear them, fear God. So Peter, before he gives us the verse where we get the whole term for apologetics, hearkens back to Isaiah and the coming of an Assyrian army and Isaiah saying to God's people, do not fear them, fear God. Do not look to them, look to God. So in the midst of your suffering, do not fear those who are bringing about your suffering, but fear God. 
Do not allow your attention to be drawn away to an attempt to appease them, but instead hold firm, endure whatever you must endure because your goal is honor Christ the Lord. That's your goal. Apologetics can't be man-centered. And far too often it is. We do apologetics with a view toward making people think well of us. You'll find that nowhere in this text. This is not about people thinking well of us as individuals. It's born of our devotion to Christ. And our personal holiness requires an explanation. Look at the next part of this. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. So here, there's this personal holiness that sets us apart. It makes us strangers and aliens, as he says in 2.11. Because of this personal holiness with strangers and aliens, one of the results of being strangers and aliens is that we tend to suffer and be persecuted because we're strangers and aliens. As we suffer and are persecuted as strangers and aliens, our personal holiness reminds us that this is all about our devotion to Christ. And simultaneously, it assures us that an explanation will be required. We don't just suffer in silence. We explain why we suffer. Not only that, the explanation is part of what causes us suffering. A, a dear friend of mine, uh, I won't name drop, uh, but a dear friend of mine, a pastor that you would know and you'd think I was cool because he's my friend, um, <laughs> he talked about, he got some advice as a young man when he was uh, going off to college. And the advice was, you know on the first day in your class, before that professor who intimidates you, you know what you ought to do? You ought to just make it a point in that class to openly profess that you are a Christian and that you believe the Bible to be true. And he, and he says, I, I'm sitting here and I'm going, yeah, that's, that's, those are the guys they don't respect. Why would I want to openly on the first day in my class identify myself to my professor and everybody else in the class as one of those types of individuals that they don't respect? The answer was so you can remove the temptation to compromise in order to impress. Our personal holiness sets us apart as strangers and aliens. We begin to suffer as strangers and aliens because we're strangers and aliens. And in the midst of it, he says, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Keep your eyes on him. Don't look at the Assyrian army. Keep your eyes on him. Don't fear the Assyrian army. Keep your eyes on him. Do not compromise in the face of the Assyrian army. Keep your eyes on him. And then he says, oh, by the way, there's going to be an explanation required and your tendency will be, this is implied here, your tendency will be to explain your personal holiness in the least offensive manner possible so that you can reduce the likelihood of more suffering. And so modern evangelism leaves out things like, oh, I don't know, sin repentance and instead here's what modern evangelism sounds like right now your personal happiness level is about a five I think mine's an eight or a nine and if you listen to my personal story I'll tell you how I got to an eight or a nine and then you too can be as happy and fulfilled as I if you will just say yes to Jesus who by the way is pining over you and crying tears, begging you to just let him make you happier than you already are. You can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. 
This is what personal evangelism sounds like today. Right now, there's, a, there's an election going on. And, you know, I, I'm living over across the water in a different part of the world. And, but I still hear what's happening here. And I hear people saying things like, well, you know, we need to get away from all of these social issues, these moral issues, because those aren't winners. We're slaughtering babies by the thousands and saying that two men or two women can get married. We're shaking our fists in the face of God. However, whatever you do, don't make this about any of that. Because we might offend the people that we need to like us. This is a matter of personal holiness. This is not about winning philosophical arguments. This is about our willingness to be identified with Christ to the degree that it will cost us. Interestingly enough, he says, anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. By the way, if we go back and look, for example, at that first chapter, look at chapter one, beginning at verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. There's the hope to which he refers. And he says that we're to give an answer. We're to give an apologia. You know, yesterday we looked at a term that was brought from the realm of personal combat. Today, this term, this idea is brought from the realm of the law. You're like a lawyer who is giving a defense. And when a lawyer gives a defense, you don't just give the information. You give the information in the most winsome and effective manner you can. This is not just about dry information. We have a passion here and a desire here to win souls. So even in the midst of our suffering, our desire is that we witness to our hope, but not just witness to our hope, but witness to our hope in such a way that it will be appealing and attractive and effective for those who hear so that while they persecute us, we offer them life. This is apologetics. This is not arrogant grandstanding. This goes to the heart of who we are as a people set apart for God. For the sake of time, we won't do it today, but we'll talk more about this idea of knowing what we believe and why we believe and what the implications of that are not just for our personal holiness, but even for our personal study. Next, our personal holiness shapes our explanation. It doesn't just require our explanation, it shapes our explanation. It says, and yet do it with gentleness and respect. Do it with gentleness and respect. This is, again, gentleness. Remember what we said yesterday, the 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice. We don't believe the other 10. We, we don't believe that. We don't, we despise manliness. We just don't like it. We don't like it when a pastor stands up flat-footed and just says, thus saith the Lord. 
without apologizing for what God has said. We don't like that. It just doesn't seem right to us. It doesn't seem Christ-like. And so when we see a word here like gentleness, all of a sudden now, we, we just we, we want to say, well, see, that, that, there it is. That, that's how we're supposed to do this. And so there's all these confrontations. You speak out against something and you get volumes of letters because you just didn't do it with the right kind of gentleness. I don't necessarily disagree with you, but you could have been more gentle. <coughs> Help you. <laughs> we are more offended by manliness today than we are by sin. And some of y'all are offended because I said manliness because that's not paying enough attention to women. (laughs) But I said manliness. Amen. Amen. Love women. Married to one. Raising two. Hoping for another. But manliness and gentleness are not mutually exclusive. Gentleness is not the lack of strength or the lack of power or the lack of passion. Gentleness is, gentleness is strength and power and passion under control. See, gentleness is me wrestling with my two-year-old. I could crush him. <laughs> but I dare not. That's gentleness. Folks, we are not gentle because all the power resides on their side. Come on, preach. Christ wasn't gentle because he just said, you know, you know what? I, I could call down 10,000 angels right now and deal with all this right here. But instead, I'm going to the cross. That's gentleness. That's gentleness. And this fear and reverence and respect here is not about a fear of man. But again, based on what we saw earlier in verse 15, it's about our fear of God. So our personal holiness even shapes the way we do apologetics. We are not the arrogant jerks that are so often pictured as apologists. We are gentle. Strength and power under control. Not even under our control. Surrendered to the person and power of the Holy Spirit. This is who we are. You know, the pendulum has swung in Christian culture. We so feminized Christianity that there was a generation and there is a generation today who's kind of gotten sick of all of that weak, feminized Christianity. And now they're swinging the pendulum in the other direction and they're beginning to behave like barbarians. We should be confident. but not confident in ourselves. Confident in the one who has redeemed us. Confident enough to exercise gentleness. Finally, our holiness vindicates our explanation. For it is better, verse 17, to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. The beauty there is that Christ is shown as our example in two ways. Number one, he's our example of gentleness. He's our example of suffering rightly. But secondly, he's also our example of hope. Why did Christ suffer? Because he had hope that his father would raise him up. 
It's because of his hope that he was able to endure. And it's because of who Christ is in us that we are able to endure. Notice that we began and ended this section with suffering. Almost as though Peter is saying apologetics is about suffering rightly. It's about our willingness to suffer because of our personal holiness, having made us strangers and aliens. It's about the nature of our suffering. We suffer as those who are willing not only to endure the suffering, but even in our response to the suffering, we're willing to say things that might make the suffering worse. And it is about the vindication of our suffering. Vindicated, number one, because in our suffering, we are identifying with Christ who suffered. And secondly, vindicated it because ultimately, what can they do? What can you do to me? I love that section there in Acts chapter 4 when Peter and John are called before the Sanhedrin because they were preaching in the name of Jesus and they were told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And their response was, we, we, we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. And I always imagine in my mind that scene when the powerful Sanhedrin has said to these men, you, you stop this. And then they come back and it says they threatened them again. They threatened them further. What did that look like? Stop preaching in the name of Jesus. No. They, they said, no. They said, okay. if you don't stop preaching in the name of Jesus, we'll take all your stuff. Man, this is Acts chapter 4. We gave our stuff away in chapter 2. <laughs> they, they got no, no stuff. What are we going to do? Stop preaching in the name of Jesus or we'll kill you. You mean like you killed him before he was resurrected? <laughs> For us to live is Christ. To die is gain. Folks, you can't threaten a dead man. But here's our problem. And here's why we don't engage in apologetics. Most of us refuse to die. We want the Assyrians to like us. And so we set them apart as holy. They are the ultimate goal and the ultimate end for which we live. And so we do whatever we must do in order to please and appease them and to be thought well of by them. And the more we give, the more they demand. Peter says, mm -mm. get your eyes off the Assyrians. Put your eyes on Christ. When you do, number one, you will see that he's a sufferer. And yet he endured unjust suffering. And in enduring the unjust suffering and dying and raising again, he has given you all that you need in order to endure as well. Not just an example, but an empowerment to achieve it. And secondly, as you do it, recognize these individuals are not the ones with the power. They cannot give you what Christ has given you. You already possess more than they can imagine. Why do you want something from them? In fact, it's the other way around. You are the one who possesses what they need. Here's where the gentleness comes in. Isn't this a far cry? from apologetics as a means of impressing people? 
This is about who we are in Christ. This is about where our hope is. And this is about conducting ourselves in such a way that who we are and where our hope is causes those who hate God to hate us as well. And then responds with a winsome, effective explanation for why it is we are the thing that they hate and why the thing that they hate is the thing that they need more than anything else in the world. If they hear that and repent and are saved, we rejoice. If they hear that and it enrages them further, we suffer rightly. Because sometimes they don't hear your words until they've seen your deeds. Again, this is not deeds instead of words. It's not what I said. But this text requires both from us. There were those at the crucifixion all the way up to the time that he died were doing nothing but heaping insults and pain and injury upon him. And then after he had breathed his last, there were people who were saying, surely, surely he was. We don't know what God will use. Amen? But we do want to know what God requires. And so we give him that because of our love for him, because of our pursuit of personal holiness, and because of our desire to be a witness to a lost, hurting, and dying world. This is the link between apologetics and personal holiness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your gentleness toward us. Thank you for your patience, your long suffering, your loving kindness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for reminding us that we need not a fear, need not fear the approaching Assyrian army because you are their God as well as ours, whether they acknowledge it or not. Grant by your grace that as we pursue personal holiness, as we are conformed to the image of Christ, and as that costs us more and more dearly, that our response would be faithful witness to the reason for the hope that is in us. Grant this, we pray, in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.